Hi, my name is Sean Pierce, and welcome to the world of alternate data streams. You can hit me up on Twitter if you have any questions. All right, so who am I? I am Sean Pierce, as I just said. I am a red team lead at Target, uh, so I spend a lot of my time looking at malware and making sure that we can defend and respond to it appropriately. And in general, I dig into a lot of sneaky and tricky things. Uh, before that, I was at eyesight slash mandiant slash fireeye, uh, doing cyber exercises and general offensive stuff. And uh, before that, I got a bachelor's in computer engineering, minor in math, currently I'm working on my master's at NYU. I have CISSP and a few other certs. I've spoken at Black Hat, DEF CON, and a few other places. Now quick, you probably already know what an alternate data stream is because you found this video. But just in case, I'm just gonna tell you it's a sneaky way to hide files or folders. Now you might be thinking, okay, cool, but why, are, why haven't I heard about this before? Well, it's really old and every time it gets kind of rediscovered every 10 or so years, which is the name of this talk. I first learned about it in probably about 2012 when I saw Mark Baggett's owned Windows owned by default talk and it was really, really good. And uh, basically Windows only really uses alternate data streams anymore to have this kind of like mark of the web. So if you download something from the internet, like an executable and try to double click it, it'll say, hey, are you sure you want to run this? And it's pretty much the only thing it's used for anymore. But in the past is also, alternate data streams have also been used to like kind of hide like author title metadata and other kind of small little bits of information here and there. Um, if you dig deeper, some people call these alternate data streams resource forks or just forks in file system parlance. But more specifically, email clients and, and browsers will save files with a special com object. And this com object, when saving this file to the hard drive, will tag it with this little zone identifier. So if you, you know, download with Chrome or something or Firefox or IE, it'll add this hidden alternate data stream and just have this little bit of information in there. And that's what Windows 8.1 and above use for like that smart screen, like, are you sure you wanna do this? And it does some other little checks. Um, I've also seen in Windows 10 and above, there's occasional alternate data stream of like Win32 app underscore one. And I've tracked it down to this like Windows search indexer and I've taken apart the binary and I still can't quite figure out why it's adding that to some random files, but whatever. Um, and I've also searched across probably 10,000 endpoints or so, and I still can't figure out why, but Symantec occasionally adds like what looks to be a hash as an alternate data stream and no data, but whatever. So, <clears throat> so in like Windows 8.1 and above, uh, it's, it's as far as I can see, uh, the zone transfer file also gets a refer and host URL added. And this can be really useful for like forensics purposes. So I remember my girlfriend asked me for help on her computer once and I looked in her downloads folder and I saw flash player, flash player, flash player, flash player. And so of course I cracked open the alternate data stream and, and the URL here did not say adobe.com. It was from something else. So it, it can be pretty useful to have some kind of idea of where executables came from. And if you wanted to crack those execute, if you want to crack those alternate data streams open, you can use notepad or a command like this, where you just say more and then less than uh, sign, which is a pipe redirect. And then you just have to really specify colon zone dot identifier. Now you may be thinking, cool, um, how do I do this? Well, this is how, you just can echo something into it and that creates the stream. Now, normal files have a default data stream or an unnamed data stream, and that's where all the data is kept. And there's even been some uh, newer techniques where if you wanted to delete a file while still using it, you can go and just manually delete that kind of unnamed data stream but we're not gonna be doing it here. We're gonna be looking at sneaky, like attackery things. And you might be thinking, okay, cool. How do I view these alternate data streams? Well, dir slash r is the easy answer, but there are also lots of programs out there like Mark Lucinovich's uh, sysinternals streams tool, 
uh, which is free and uh, available from Microsoft. You can just say, hey, streams, and then a file, and it will show you all of its data streams. And we'll show you how to get around that here in this talk. Now, you might be thinking, cool, what about PowerShell? Well, you, there's a dash stream option from get item. Now, there's only like seven or eight commandlets in PowerShell that are kind of alternate data stream aware. But here is some basic code that will get you started and a list of few, a few other binaries that'll show you alternate data streams. Now, of course, when I first saw this as, as an attacker, I usually like to immediately hide executables in these alternate data streams and then tried to execute them. And I was just like, oh, this isn't working. Well, darn. And it turns out, you know, Microsoft kind of figured people would be abusing this. And I think it was Windows NT and above, aka uh, Windows 2000, Windows uh, XP, uh, they just stopped allowing executables to be run via the start verb keyword uh, just from the command prompt. So like notice that again, like the payload here being put behind this file doesn't actually change the files like data. It doesn't change the hash of the file. It doesn't change the timestamp. It doesn't change the file size, which can, was really cool, really sneaky. But there is an open handle if you manage to get something running from that uh, executable and that hidden alternate data stream, which we will show you how to do. And you can use the make link command, but this requires administrative privileges. So what can we do that doesn't require administrative privileges to create a harder or soft link? Well, the first technique that I really like is you just create a shortcut file to something right next to your target, and then you crack it open in a hex editor, and then you can replace the bytes in that LNK file in order to point to the proper location of your payload. And this works just fine, and you can even take this LNK and send it to your willing victim, and they can just double click on it, and it executes without a problem. And you might be thinking, okay, that's really cool, but what if I don't want to crack things open in a hex editor because I'm scared of hex? Well, there's other things that can be done. The most common thing I've seen out there is using WMI or Wimic.exe. Of course, I think Wimic has technically been deprecated for a few years now, and so you probably don't want to keep relying on that. Uh, but PowerShell does have a sneaky kind of invocation of this called invoke-wmi method, in which you can pretty much specify the same thing, and it doesn't complain. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, WMI is kind of, or Wimic in particular is kind of deprecated. What should I do instead if I don't want to do that? Run DLL32 is a classic, and it's very easy to build a DLL. Here's my source code for this DLL on the left, and you can just specify that DLL in that alternate data stream that you just chunk that DLL into, and then you can just specify the function name that you're calling within that DLL. Wscript and cscript.exe are my favorites because I've seen bad guys do this a lot. And, well, not a lot. I've seen them do it. And this is the most common way for them to abuse uh, executable code in alternate data streams. And this can be really useful for several reasons. Now, I've also seen like, some pen testers hide the text of scripts in alternate data streams like this, in this PowerShell, and then they chunk out that PowerShell and just pipe it directly into a PowerShell executable. I think that's okay, but I think that kind of doesn't make PowerShell really aware of that alternate data stream. But I like this idea of hiding the alternate data stream location as an argument. And remember we were talking about LNKs before and shortcuts. Well, we can specify Cscript or Wscript or Wimic and then specify the alternate data stream as an argument. And that is a way that create shortcut dialog boxes will just accept alternate data streams because they're not actually going to check to make sure that the argument's valid. They're just gonna make sure that the thing they're pointing at actually exists. And you might be thinking, well, cool, but is anyone actually doing this? And the answer is yes. Uh, APT32, or AKA Cobalt Kitty, was observed uh, not too long ago and multiple times. Uh, and you can look at Cyber Reason's uh, Asif's 
Donhan Dahan report, uh, link in the description, and uh, there they specify that they saw this code being used by the threat actor, and it is using WScript to look f and then chunking in a alternate data stream from this log.txt. Now, CScript and WScript are kind of wrappers for Microsoft's active engines or active interpreters. And you can specify which engine it should be using with a slash E. So you can say slash E VB script or slash E J script or slash E JavaScript. And it will say, okay, I'm gonna use this active engine to execute this as this kind of code. So if I were you, if I were a defender, I would look for the slash E invocation because it's really weird. And I only know of a few people that do this and they're all bad threat actors. So if you have access, look across your environment and uh, let me know if you find anything because I love that stuff. So you might be thinking, cool, C script, W script, Wimic, um, they're all, you know, like code executor programs, but what about normal executables that uh, might just be used or abused uh, to get to that alternate data stream? And, and there are lots of executables in Windows, and the Lulbins project has done a great job of documenting them. And you can even say, hey, which ones support alternate data streams? And it'll give you this great list. Now, if you're thinking I want to just make my own program, I would advise staying away from .NET slash C Sharp. Uh, they don't, C Sharp doesn't natively support these alternate data stream uh, path, um, the colon in the path. Uh, so you have to kind of stick with C, C++, and, and maybe some other languages that I haven't tried. And if you just want to stick to the command line, uh, you can, and that's kind of a, a janky way of doing it, but it's, it's possible. Now, a lot of people are just like, okay, well, antivirus companies kind of already know about these techniques and they know about alternate data streams and they scan for them. This isn't such a big deal because there's lots of little sneaky places to hide an operating system. But we can start stacking techniques and saying, hey, well, what if we have an alternate data stream behind a file system reserved keyword or something weird like that? Now, if you've never heard of these file system reserved keywords, they can be a lot of fun. Basically, there are things that should not exist. There are things that Explorer will not let you create, like the word con. If you create a folder or a file named con, it will not let you do it, it being explorer.exe. Now, if you think, okay, that's a little weird, why? Well, it's because just the legacy of Windows, con used to be console. So if you could, if you were wanted to print out to the screen, you would say print out to the console. And as Windows evolved, they just kind of kept some of these old legacy things in there. And they said, okay, it'll really mess things up if people create con as a folder or a file. So we're just going to not let them. And there's a few of these file system reserved keywords like AUX or AUX1 or 2 or COM4, um, I believe. So we can create these manually by writing our own program or just using these prepended path specifiers, the slash slash dot slash or slash slash question mark slash. And it's because it's accessing these things through an alternate namespace. And uh, Matt Graber wrote about this in 2011 on exploit-monday.com. Again, all, all links in the description. And it, there was a lot of really cool reasons that Microsoft did this. You know, part of it being they wanted to support really long path names or really strange paths that maybe include other computers. But we can use them and abuse them by creating these files that should not exist. And the cool effect of this is we can hide an alternate data stream that something like streams.exe can't find or PowerShell can't find. Here, PowerShell is like, hey, we cannot find this path because this path does not exist and gets really, really angry about it. Like PowerShell is just like, no, stop. <laughs> so this is really cool. We can hide an alternate data stream behind this file system reserved keyword uh, file. But what if we wanted to do something even more sneaky? When we wanted to stack even more stuff, well, we can create file system re re reserved keywords 
as folders too. So here we're creating this AUX folder that shouldn't exist, and we're gonna create an AUX file that shouldn't exist inside that folder, and then we're gonna hang an alternate data stream off that file and folder. And just for good measure, instead of using wscript or cscript.exe, you'll just, you know, just straight to this alternate data stream, which defenders might look for on a company-wide basis, we're renaming this kind of wscript or, or cscript.exe. And it's really easy to rename. It still will work. It's, you know, wscript and cscript.exe are on every Windows computer since like you know, Windows 2000 or something like that. So we can use that then to execute our payload, which is really cool. It still works and it's, you know, it flies under a lot of radars. And I've seen bad guys do it, so I've kind of added it to my arsenal. Now, you might be thinking, cool, but what should we put in there? Well, I would personally, and I've personally seen threat actors, uh, use these shortcuts to point to alternate data streams after renaming a uh, executable like cscript.exe. And they will do this in like from a word macro. So they get code execution, they do a few things, and one of them is like, copy and rename cscript and then point to the payload that they just dropped with that word macro. Now, fewer detections uh, are kind of the idea behind just using LNKs uh, as opposed to executables being dropped in the startup folder. Uh, but again, we can do more sneaky things if that's like a little too bland for your taste, like cipher.exe. It's on every Windows computer. It can be used to encrypt things with the file system uh, encryption that Microsoft built into things, and it's encrypted per user. So this makes it really useful for being a little bit more resistant to your payloads being swept up. So let's say your LNK here did alert, uh, and responders are sending their tools down to sweep up, you know, whatever executables or LNKs or whatever that they find. Well, if they did that, uh, they're usually running their tools as like system, right? Like thought to be like the highest user, like most permissions possible on any Windows computer. Uh, most forensic tools run as that. And they say, okay, let me access this file on the hard drive. And they grab it, not knowing it's encrypted. And it'll just look like gibberish on their side. They have to be that user in order to properly get the file in its true form in its unencrypted form. Now, just a few more notes about the C script and W script. Um, a lot of threat actors, and including myself when I'm, I'm pretending to be a bad guy, use the slash B to suppress windows and, and prompts and, and any, any errors. Uh, this J script is this, you know, not quite JavaScript uh, by, you know, technical standards. Uh, Microsoft implemented JavaScript and called it J script and <laughs> kind of uh, abandoned the project. It, which is understandable. They maintain dozens of languages and tons and tons of libraries for all sorts of things. And so this is built into Windows and has been for a long time. And Microsoft just said, we're not going to continue developing this. In fact, if you go to Microsoft's website and you say, hey, I want the documentation for JScript, they actually point you to Mozilla.org. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's pretty much JavaScript, but there's a few things missing and it's, it's not a browser based JavaScript. Uh, and there's like a few objects that you can access that normal JavaScript can't. And there's like a, a bunch of com objects it has access to, which makes for some weird and interesting capabilities. Long story short, uh, JScript, this how you execute with CScript or WScript, isn't quite JavaScript. Um, similarly, you can specify to CScript and WScript, even if you rename the binary, you can specify JavaScript and you can specify JScript in the slash E parameter. And so the .js extension on that payload is no longer required. So this is something I see a lot of threat actors doing. Uh, it's really suspicious to use that slash E. And uh, there are some cool like attacker tools out there. Uh, one of which my favorite is .NET to JScript. So if you have a .NET application like, you know, a shellcode injector written in C Sharp, you can actually, uh, thanks to James Forshaw, no, not James Forshaw, um, I can't remember the creator of, of .NET to James, JScript right now, um, but it's been rolled into a few other tools like Cactus Torch, uh, basically will take your C Sharp executable 
and turn it into JScript. And it'll use com objects to like kind of instantiate and you know decode uh, your executable and run it in memory. Note you have to use this, well, you should, it is highly recommended that you use the 64-bit version of uh, C script and W script uh, to execute your J script uh, if you want to get shell code injection, native shell code injection to work. And for this, I highly recommend you use C colon slash sysnative wscript.exe. <clears throat> now, we can continue to combine sneaky techniques. Um, another one is volume shadow copy. You can execute a payload from a volume shadow copy. You can use CLS IDs or class identifiers. Uh, this is really sneaky, and I don't think you can see the alternate data streams behind these because things get redirected. Like if you were to name a file this CLS ID, it'll send you to the control panel, particularly like a connect your desktop programs to your workplace control panel part. And it's really weird, and there's just hundreds of these class identifiers and they're they're used for windows system internal stuff so we're, we're not really supposed to be aware of them but we can certainly mess with them and we can certainly use uh, some of these class identifiers to hide our payload behind and still execute things and they are still not visible to uh, most products that just don't know how to deal with these windows wasn't really made with a lot of this stuff in mind note the con file system reserve keyword doesn't play well as a folder and it doesn't play well with CLS IDs. And um, you shouldn't use UNC paths with WIMIC or cmd.exe. They just don't work very well. However, this really is good with registry and shortcuts, shortcut persistence, especially if someone is trying to delete the file. Uh, I do a lot of CCDC, so I'm you know, very offensive minded in that where I know that the blue teams are going to find my payloads and they're going to try to rip them out as fast as they can. They know the boxes are compromised. I know they're going to come for it. So making these files that they can't select or delete or remove or rename, or if they double click it, it goes somewhere weird. That's that tickles my fancy. Like it's, it's really good to have in your back pocket. And we can also, you know, use cipher.exe to encrypt these. We can also mark these as system files with a trib plus s. We can mark these as hidden files with a trib plus h. Um, now, this doesn't really do anything to protect the files a whole lot. Just that plus s marking it as a system file, it really only just gives an extra little pop-up warning like, hey, this is a system file. Are you sure you want to delete this? And of course, someone knows they're looking at malware, just going to say yes, like, not a big deal. Um, changing ownership of the information can be really sneaky. Uh, take own slash F is how you do it. And uh, I usually like to target trusted installer. So trusted installer is actually above like NT authority system. Like it's above administrator. It is the actual owner of a lot of binaries in system 32, which is why as administrator, if you crack open Windows C colon slash Windows system 32 and start trying to delete or rename binaries, it won't let you say permission denied. It's because the system isn't actually the owner of a lot of those files. It's trusted installer. So it's just a little bit more powerful and it's a little bit harder to, to get the access uh, tokens for trusted installer. Now, if you want to even mess with the permissions even more, which a lot of bad guys like to do, um, actually, I haven't seen it all that common, uh, usually in like one-off things. Uh, you can do that. Like this command right here, I've seen in malware, I can see that it is targeting a payload and saying everyone has deny access to this. Like administrators can't even access this like only this particular user only this particular thing can can read this but others can maybe execute it um or you can add a space or a unicode character at the beginning or at the end of your payload so dot dot is usually the character or two characters for the directory above you so if you say cd for change directory space dot dot it sends you to the directory above well if we add this Unicode character that's like invisible and name our payload dot dot, then we can 
just create this file, uh, especially in Linux, where it's by default invisible with anything starting with a dot, uh, you can hide an alternate data stream off of that. So here below, you can see me making test.exe and hiding it in an alternate data stream in this thing that looks like a directory that just means go to the directory above, but it actually has a file size associated with it. This sample that I found on VT or VirusTotal randomly uh, combines a few of these techniques. They create a file system reserve keyword, com, for, and then they add a CLS ID to it, and then they deny the administrators the right to access this. So this is running as a normal user, or they assume that the administrator is going to try to look for and remove their payload, which uh, isn't going to work. They're not going to be able to, unless they know to change those permissions back or take ownership and then change the permissions. Now, file system reserve keywords on top of alternate, on top of uh, CLS IDs, and then uh, trying to hide an alternate data stream behind those, that can work. It, there's a little, there's a few tricks that don't work, like, you know, using the keyword con, C-O-N, that tends not to work with these. So you just have to play with it and experiment. And you can definitely make a CLS ID as the name of your alternate data stream instead of payload or hidden or log.txt, you can make it a CLS ID. And you might be thinking, okay, this is getting a little convoluted. Does anyone actually do this? Uh, yeah, we have seen at least one threat actor named Turla use a CLS ID as an, the name of their alternate data stream. <clears throat> now, you might be thinking, okay, cool. What if I wanted to zip up these payloads? And I've done this before, and by default, it doesn't work. You can't use uh, a lot of native tools for this. You have to use like WinZip or WinRAR or 7zip.exe to preserve the streams by the parameter dash SNS. Otherwise, it will not preserve the streams and it, this will not work. Like if you were to transfer, if you were to hide a payload behind a file and then you were to drag it over to a NSF or drag it over to a really old fat drive, um, the really old file system that Microsoft, I don't know if they still support it, but it's, it's really old. Um, you shouldn't have like a flash drive or anything with this old file system. But if you do, it doesn't support alternate data streams similar to being zipped. So if you drag it over and drag it back, it'll lose the alternate data stream. It'll warn you, Microsoft Windows will, will warn you that you're gonna lose some data, but it won't say what data you're losing or, or anything like that. So if you if you have played with alternate data streams before, if you like were taking a whole bunch of files that were originally created on Mac uh, OS or with the HFS, their, their, I think, high file system. And if you were to drag a whole bunch of uh, those files over to like a fat formatted flash drive, it might have warned you like, hey, you're losing some stuff because Macs usually like to hide icons in these alternate data streams. Okay, so that might have been a confusing thing. But anyways, so you might have thinking, oh, you might be thinking, okay, cool, I'll zip up my payload in an alternate data stream and then email it. Well, you, you can do that. Uh, and there are advantages to that, like, uh, Windows, if you get a zip file from an email or something and you double click it and then you like extract all and it spits out all the files, it'll still have that zone identifier, that mark of the web, follow those files. However, if you use 7-zip, it will not. And if you use a self-extracting executable, then the mark of the web doesn't follow the files that it drops. So it is a way to kind of get past a little bit the mark of the web here. Now, there have been a few other instances, a few, few other public observances of alternate data streams, and it's usually just like stacked on top of, you know, already like weird stuff. So I've seen, uh, what was it, Vietnamese intelligence, I think, ABT like 33 or 31, I think Ocean Lotus is their name. I've seen them use a lot of Stego and pictures and a lot of just really weird things. And, you know, here is, is the Dukes 
and I believe that's like a Russian Nexus uh, like intelligence gathering hacking group. Uh, they use like Stego and alternate data streams and encryption. And uh, I think like kind of more historical looking back and other public observances of malware, you know, taking advantage of this particular alternate data stream uh, feature, I've seen it being used. I, I don't remember the name of the malware, but I remember it like one malware drop, being dropped to the sandbox and not running. And when I dug into it, like as soon as it was run, it would check to see if it had a zone identifier. So it was looking for that mark of the web. And if it didn't have it, it wouldn't execute. I and mean, suddenly it made sense because it's like, oh, this thing came as an attachment on emails. It should always have the mark of the web because it's always being downloaded through a web client or an email client or a web browser. So it's always gonna have that mark. And if it doesn't, it knows it's in a sandbox and so it won't execute. Cool. I've seen, uh, well, I couldn't personally verify this, BitPamer, some ransomware, I saw a report saying that they used alternate data streams to hide and run NetView from. I couldn't verify that. I looked through the binary. It wasn't immediately obvious. Uh, similar with service hijacking, I saw, you know, some people saying, "Hey, this is using it for you know using alternate data streams for service hijacking." Again, I couldn't verify that. But I have seen like registry persistence, service persistence, and UAC bypass. Uh, being leveraging alternate data streams. Most kind of famously is uh, an Empire or Rhino Security's um, alt aggressor scripts for Cobalt Strike. They use alternate data streams to hide some PowerShell or hide a DLL as they need to temporarily drop it to disk or use something for a scheduled task persistence. If you have any questions, let me know. Hit me up on Twitter. I am always available and thank you for coming to my talk.